Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is artist Joan Rosenberg Dent. Joan, welcome. Thank you, David. Um, it's exciting to see a lot of you <laughs> recently, <laughs> and um, it's going to be really exciting to talk about your work, which if people know it, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, Joan is on TV. <laughs> um, and um, I'm always curious to hear a little bit about the background, about how someone got into their, their art form. Could you give us just a short version of that? Well, I've always loved making things. Mm -hmm. My father had a five and dime store uh -huh. and I had access to all the toys in the world, practically. But the thing I liked most of all were a, a paint set mm -hmm. and um, drawing uh, pencils and most of all was clay. Uh, yeah. Remember the, the model, mo little modeling clay? It came in a box with like five little uh -huh. colors. Uh -huh. That would keep me busy forever. So <laughs> it's that started really young. That is I, so young, yeah. That's how few people actually go on from their you know childhood passion to make a career out of it. Well, who knew it would yeah. be, but it was just something I loved to do. Yeah. And then later on, I got very involved in dance, mm -hmm. and somehow I was able to bring clay and sculpture and dance together for a lifetime. Yeah. Well, there's a real sense of, of rhythm and harmony and movement in your pieces that I think is clearly, you know, uh, comes from your dance background. Um, so we have got a, a number of, of pieces that we're going to look at. But before we do, we're talking about porcelain frequently. Um, tell us a little bit about the process of, of, of making porcelain. Well, porcelain is a kind of a clay. And it's very special because the particle size is teeny tiny, the smallest particle size in any clay body. So when, the, when it gets fused together and gets put in the kiln, there are are no air pockets, hardly okay. anything. It's so tight that it can be very, very strong while it's thin, unlike any other clay. Mm. So you can work with it really thin and allow translucency to come through the clay because it's so thin and so strong. It's interesting, I think, of that phrase, as delicate as porcelain, but you're saying actually porcelain is not that delicate. It, no, it's a very strong right. clay, but when you work thin with it and you it knock it the off the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You throw it off the table, it's in there. <laughs> all bets are off, yeah. Well, let's take a look. We were just talking about porcelain. Um, we have some shots from uh, your work, and the first one is called Naked, Naked Porcelain. And what are we looking at here? Well, I, I call it my work Naked Porcelain because I don't glaze it. Okay. And I don't glaze it so I can allow the translucency to come through the clay. So most of my pieces are unglazed, naked porcelain, and all my pieces deal with a concept or an idea behind the piece. And then the piece appears as um, an abstracted uh, piece of art. Well, let me stop you there. Why is that so important to have this idea behind the, the piece rather than just to be trying to make the most beautiful shape that you can you could do why what, what what what's additionally gained by well that? i remember when i was in art school we were talking about what's the difference between art and craft mm. and the main difference was art there was something behind it craft is just something you make it's a decorative thing art has a little bit more substance mm -hmm. and i was going to be an artist not a craftsman right. So I've always thought uh, it would be important to have an idea because I want to visually communicate an idea. That's why I'm doing what mm -hmm. I do. So it's very important for me to have an idea behind my work. Okay, so something for the viewer to look at, to, to figure out, to speculate on. I mean, that's, those are the things that I associate when I'm looking at a painting, for instance, in, a, in an art gallery. Um, let's take a look at the, the next uh, piece that you have here. 
A dancer, I think, right? Yeah, well, dancer has a little story behind it. Uh, I was a dancer all through high school and into college, and then I took a master class, and I was classical ballet. And I walked into the master class, and the teacher was barefoot in a long draped black dress leaning on a cane. That was the gesture of her. Oh, wow. And it, it gave me freedom. It was like, you mean you don't have to be choreographed. Every step doesn't have to be uh -huh. choreographed. You don't have to choreograph your life. You have, it gave me this freedom throughout my life from this dancer. And, her, and, and you seem to have caught her position right there, right? I mean, <laughs> it, well, that was her, that was a gesture. She yeah. was leaning on her cane and her name was Martha Graham. Uh, yeah, that's gorgeous. And in the next one, uh, you can see I started a whole dance series. And sometimes I would do two pieces together and call it duet. I would put a black and a white to make the black even look blacker and the white even whiter to draw attention between the pieces. Sometimes I would put five pieces together. And the most fun is I have people come into the studio and they choreograph their own dance. Uh -huh. They take the dancers off the shelf and they set them up. They could have big ones with little ones. They could have seven or five or two. And they play and interact with my pieces. And that interaction just fulfills me so much. Mm -hmm. I just so enjoy having that happen. Yeah, when I, when I was looking at those two pieces, I was that's exactly what I was thinking. What if there was more? Where, <laughs> <laughs> how would you arrange them? So that's really exciting for your uh, people who, who own your pieces. Um, so we'll move from a syncopation to another dance-related uh, Yeah, image. so I was doing many of these uh, gestural dance pieces, and I thought, why not really abstract from it? Mm -hmm. And this is an abs a real abstraction, and it's called Dance in Space because it's still dealing with dance. It's dealing with form. It's dealing with the space between the forms. It's dealing with the relationship of the parts and the pieces. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it, it's so similar to when you're dancing that um, now I've become the choreographer and my pieces are my dancers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so if we come back to the studio for just a second, did you ever uh, at some point think um, maybe I do want to go back to dance and become a choreographer? Was that ever a temptation? It was, yeah. but... Um, it takes but it a lot of training, yeah, It wasn't connections, realistic, yeah. and I, I had to decide you know, which was more important. And once I really got into into clay, I loved it. I, I couldn't not be without clay. Mm -hmm. I, I had to be doing it. Mm -hmm. I still dance around my house, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't perform. Yeah, don't so. dance too close to the porcelain. <laughs> um, let's take a look at the next piece here. So I went from doing tabletop sculptures to something very different. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the studio trying to figure out what would I do next? Where was my next move going to be? And I threw some clay against the wall mm -hmm. and it went splat and stuck on the wall. Right. And I thought, I should do wall pieces. Right. So this whole idea came from being blocked and being right. blocked is not a bad thing. You <laughs> let not it fly. Huh? Yeah. So this is the beginning of the wall pieces. It's a 24 by 24 uh, piece. It's porcelain. But what I did differently was I took the porcelain and I pulled it away from the, the wood panel. And then the shadows filled the spaces mm. and gave the piece so much more depth. They really do, especially around the black pieces in the lower right hand corner, yeah. And from, from there, um, I'm influenced by many things. And one thing I do every day is I go for a walk on the beach every day. Mm -hmm. And, and I see things, I see shapes and I see nature. And anyway, this is right from the walk on the beach. It's called Flow and it's obvious what, the, what that piece mm -hmm. is about. It has the, the flow of the waves. It also reminds me of strands of kelp too, I think a little bit. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> and the next piece is very different. Um, 
This piece is, uh, we, we do a lot of traveling and have been to Japan several times, and I couldn't get over the fact that the kimonos on the outside were very plain. And once you opened it up, these wonderful patterns right, would emerge. Right. And it was such a nice surprise. And it's kind of like people, you know, people, you meet people and you think, well, they're kind of plain. <laughs> and once you get to know them. I Just about everybody has that kimono that they open that's up. That's right. Yeah, that's so great. that's the reference that uh, this piece is about. Can we can stay here and come back uh, for a moment? I want to talk about traveling because you and I were talking about it briefly before we started taping. Um, you said you've been just about everywhere, and um, I, I wonder how that influences, maybe not necessarily in particular styles or whatever, but just your approach to working with porcelain, the, the, the sense of that the world is such a wide and varied place. You know, that's an interesting question, because when I'm traveling, I am not making sketches mm -hmm. and I'm replicating what I see. It just all feeds into me. And when I come home, I never know what's going to uh -huh. come out. Uh -huh. And it, it always has something to do about traveling, but um, in a very subconscious way. Yeah. Well, and, and, and traveling is, is taking us out of our normal routines and, and putting us in a place where we're unfamiliar with the terrain. And that's clearly kind of what an artist does when they're, we're encountering their work. Um, let's take a look at the, the next piece. Um, I just wanted got? to mention yeah. one more thing. When, when I'm traveling, a lot of the times I really don't know what this particular object's supposed to be, uh -huh. but the shape is so intriguing. Uh, yeah. So the shapes I remember, uh -huh. and I bring them back with me. Okay. And it, it could be a prayer thing hanging right. you know, from a tree. It's just the way the shape is. Right. So and you're, you're not sketching it, it's just it's in, the, in your brain. Yeah, yeah interesting. So the next piece, let's take a look at where we are. Oh, this is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, this is um, called Raw Edges. This piece was constructed very differently than most of my pieces because after I laid out my huge slab of porcelain, I tore strips and I saw the edges were so incredibly beautiful. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to touch them at all. So after after making hundreds of these, firing them, putting them out on my table, I thought, well, what am I going to do with them? <laughs> and um, anyway, that was my solution. But I was working face down on the tabletop. And once it was put on a wall in a gallery You're and like, lit, wow, yeah. the shadows were so incredible yeah. that the piece really took on a whole different ambiance. It's yeah. uh, one of my favorite pieces. It's very, very natural practically untouched and it's just the way it is. Yeah, and I love how shadow and light is so important. I think there's, we can see that a little bit in the next piece too, right, Essence? Oh, uh, this piece uh, is a little 24 by 24 piece and it is all about shadows and edges and shapes. And somebody um, uh, from Region Cruise Lines saw this piece and contacted me and said, could you, can, can we commission you mm -hmm. to make this piece around six feet long? And I said, I, of course. Right. So I did, let's go to the next slide. Okay. I did this piece and it's on the region cruise ship and it is six feet long and it's i'm sorry about the glare it's the lighting there nothing i could do about yeah it. but it, it's encased in in some sort of yes there's a, a plexi box over it because right. it's in a public space right and i'm also worried about the ship going up and down and <laughs> breaking but that's never I, happened i that. couldn't <laughs> believe they wanted hundreds of porcelain pieces on a ship but, and then they asked me to make a sister piece which is right across. This sits outside of the main entrance on the region ship to um, their big restaurant. Oh, okay. And so this piece is called Land. Right. And the piece that I made, the sister piece across, are all porcelain waves, and that's the sea. Ah, nice. So it's land and sea. Nice diptych. The next one, Haiku, coming to my um, little <laughs> neck of the woods. Um, tell us about this. Well, um, I call it Haiku because it takes, it takes a form, like in poetry, like 
in, in a haiku. A haiku has a real form that it takes, and yet this, uh, it looks like another language, which we don't understand. So I thought haiku would be pretty appropriate because I don't understand Japanese. <laughs> but it just, it just felt right Yeah, to me. It's, it's a gorgeous piece. Well, let's go from haiku to our next piece, which is actually here in the studio. It's papillon, butterfly in, in French. Um, what, what is this all about? Well, this is a piece that I created during the pandemic. It starts my pandemic series. Okay. I, I do walk on the beach, and I was walking and thinking how devastating this whole pandemic is and what, what it means. And then I saw these pieces of driftwood and some wildflowers and these gorgeous shaped rocks. Mm. And I thought, you know, our world is still so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna focus on the beauty of the world. So I started doing these pieces dealing with, um, with nature. And I call these pieces, uh, they're from a series called Finding Beauty in Unprecedented Times. Mm. So, and the next slide um, that we have is actually called Finding Beauty, <laughs> right? It's called Finding Beauty. Yeah. So I, I would collect pieces of driftwood and started putting, um, adding my own wildflowers to them. That was the beginning. I did, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 of them. And then I went to the next slide and said, why not put them on the wall? Mm -hmm. So I started some wall pieces, and some are quite large. That's just an example of one. And after, after doing several uh, iterations, I moved on to the next series. And I looked around my studio, and I had been making pieces of all these parts that you see on the screen. And I was starting to collect them and was I going to throw them away or save them. What was I going to do? And I thought, you they know They are a real melange of things, aren't they? Yeah. Why not string them up? Because this piece is called My Studio. <laughs> and, and when we're looking at that, um, there's just a, a, a ton of things, right? I mean, uh, these are all leftovers? Yeah? That's wild. Yeah, they're all leftovers. But... The scraps are so beautiful that sometimes I just can't part with them. <laughs> <laughs> so af after that, um, I started thinking about what do I think about all the time? What, what do I want to concentrate on? Right. What I think about is I think about time. It's like time is something you can't touch or feel or hold or see, but it's always there. It's like how much time do I have left? How much time until I have to uh, be at my appointment? Right. How much time? It's, I'm always thinking about time. It's like um, time shapes me. Time, how does it go? I shape the time, but time shapes my world. And, and do you feel like that's overall a positive or negative interaction between you and time? Well, I think it's... Uh, I've come to terms with it. Right, right. Like, why am I feeling stressed out? Right. It's about this thing called time, and how can I deal with time? Right. But I can see moving from time as something that causes anxiety to something that once you are able to deal with it and to think you only have a limited amount of time, like we all do, that that, that gives you a certain amount of control over it, right? Well, I think as you get older, time becomes much more important mm -hmm. because that hourglass is getting full. <laughs> and you can see how much time is left. And so every minute becomes even more precious. I think when you're younger, you have all the time in the world right. and you don't ever even think about time. Right. I didn't start thinking about time until just recently. Let's go back to the piece called Rewind um, up there on the, the, the screen. How is this, what does it say about time? It's about what if you could rewind time? Uh, okay. And the next piece from that series is called Interrupted Time. And the next one is called Compressed Time. Like during the pandemic, every day was almost the same. And let me pause there because you were talking earlier about the pandemic pieces. Um, I, I was speaking to my uh, previous guest, Perry Longo, about time and, and how 
discombobulating it was for her as a poet and I was saying same thing for me I just really didn't know what to write anymore because I felt so kind of unmoored from the usual things that I think about when I'm writing a poem it, was that a problem for you well that's why I did this series <laughs> because uh, I was very affected by it and I uh, I'll show you a few more pieces. let's take a look yeah uh, the next one is called time moves slowly and what are we seeing here? And uh, people have asked me, why are these black and white stripes on the time series? To me, they're like pulsations. They could be minutes, hours, seconds. Something's always moving, ticking. Mm. So that was uh, my reasoning for, uh, for putting the black and white. And the next piece is called Memory Shaped by Time. Those are all little porcelain pieces. And uh, the next piece is still from the Time series called Labyrinth of Time. And the last two in the Time series are called, uh, that one is called, there's two of them that they work together, Collected Memories, how the memories keep building up and building up and more keep coming and coming. I see a little gray spot <laughs> space down there in both of them. What does that represent? maybe a special memory. Ah, uh, okay. And I, I would like to um, introduce... Yeah, you have a little sheet of, of, of paper yeah. here for your, your next yeah. one. I'd like to introduce you to a piece that is very important to me. Uh, this is called Template for Humanity. This was in a magazine, and I, it was their they're pattern pieces for men's shirt collars mm -hmm. hanging on a hook in a factory wall. And I got so taken by the shapes, they were so incredible, that I wanted to do a piece in those shapes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really want to make men's shirt collar, <laughs> you know. You know, right, it, that's a, got a was, limited appeal, right? But what appealed to me is that this has to do with humanity, uh -huh. the shirt collars. Right. So I call it template for humanity because each shirt collar has written on a word to live by. This is the piece, it's eight feet long. Okay. And it can be hung um, in, in two four foot, four foot sections. One could be on top of the other or, or it could be linear, how, however. And then some of the words so that you could see them better. Um, I, I tried to get a close-up of that. And what are we? What, what are some of the words? It's a little hard for me to see. It's hard for me to see too. Um, <laughs> I see love. Love, um, sympathy, empathy, caring. Joyful. Um, right. Yeah. Happiness, and uh, all the hooks were handmade. I made them all, and then. On each hook, there are three or four different shirt collars, so whoever owns it can interchange them. They all have different words, so th they can put whatever words or shapes they want in any arrangement. So it's also interactive. Right, right. And that seems to be kind of important to you, too. To, we were looking very early on in the show with the dancers and moving them around for, the, for your your viewer, the person who owns your work, to be able to interact with it, to make it different than, than what you started out with, right? Well, because it, it could go in many ways, but I, I like for people to relate to it and mm -hmm. really get into mm -hmm. it and get involved in it, and that's what I like. It's very fulfilling for me to see people have joy from interacting with my pieces. With something that you make, yeah. Yeah, and this last piece is, um, is the studio shot, and the reason I ended, ended my uh, little talk with this is because I started off telling you about naked porcelain and the translucency and why it's important. Now you can see in this picture um, on the right-hand side, you can see the sun coming through my studio window. And as the day changes, that light keeps changing. My piece keeps changing and evolving all day. And that's why I love unglazed naked porcelain. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and I got to say, that's got to be one of the best studios in town. <laughs> that's a beautiful place. So uh, tell me, uh, we, have, we have about three and a half minutes left, so I can kind of go into you as a kind of working artist. I mean, we've, we've seen the results of all these beautiful pieces that, that you make, but I want to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of you getting your hands dirty. What, what, is, what is it like to bring a piece to life? I mean, what, uh, you know, yeah. pick any one and, and, and tell us like what it's like from start to finish. I have to tell you, the discovery is the magic for uh -huh. me. First of all, I love to get covered in dirt and clay and grime. Right. Right. It's just the whole feeling of being so involved is, is important for me. The textures, the feeling of the clay, the softness, the hardness, I, I, I'm so aware of that. Mm -hmm. but, but the so discovery, very tactile. Yeah, but the discovery, sometimes I'll just make the same piece over and over and over, hundreds of them, and I don't know what's going to happen. And the discovery after I start playing with the pieces is magical. Mm -hmm. And it just fills me up. It's like the biggest joy. I just, I come into the house just, Radiant. just filled, <laughs> just filled. It's, it, it's, it's a wonderful, special feeling. And I think that's what drives me to keep doing right. it every day. Well, when something like Raw Edges or Essence, where they, there are a lot of similar pieces, are you, um, Firing each one up as you go, go along, and how does that work? What's well, I, I I fill my whole eight foot by four foot table, and then some. I bring in a couple more tables, right. and when when I think I've had enough, when I figure it out, um, I, the clay has to dry, and it has to be bone dry uh -huh. slowly, or else it'll crack. So it takes a long time, and then. The kilns are full. I, I have a few kilns, and I fill. You just put them in there. And then I have like, yes. How long does that take? Well, I fire my porcelain to about 2,700 degrees. So it takes me between eight and nine hours. And then the kiln has to cool double the time wow. before you can unload it, or you'll crack everything. Right, right. So it's, it takes a long time. Yeah. Well, and I, I love hearing about that too because it's, it's such a specific, almost industrial process for, to make these, you know, these gorgeous, delicate pieces that you've got. So um, that's a, it's a nice combination of, of things. We just have about, gosh, less than a minute left. If you were to give one piece of advice, Joan, to um, an aspiring person wanting to work in porcelain, what, what would you say to that person? I'd say go with your passion. Yeah. Go with your passion. Forget what your mom and dad told you. <laughs> it's, it really is important. Yeah. And you'll be a happier person. Is there any place in Santa Barbara where y you, could, you would send someone to, to learn the basics? You could go to Adult Ed. You could go to the Clay, the clay Studio. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not teaching anymore. Okay, I'm, so not, not you, uh, but I'm, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I've been contacted. To, no, I'm sure, yeah. This is just my time. Yeah. I've been a professor for years, so this is my time in the studio. Well, that, we're going to have to end on that note, but um, your time in the studio is very well spent, so thank you so much for being on the program. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. The Creative Community is a co-production of TVSB in Santa Barbara and CAPS Media in Ventura. It is presented with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we'll see you next time.